battle for the Lord. He took a stand for freedom. From Jesus took the sword. And millions are in danger if they even speak his name. But boldly they proclaim that we're the reason Jesus came. We've got to tell the truth.
pray together and ask the Lord to meet with us tonight in this service. You pray as I pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can pray. We thank you that we know we have a living God that hears us. We thank you that you're all powerful, that you can make a difference in our lives and in our world. We praise you, Lord, for that. We thank you, Father, as they just sung, that we can come to this place and learn more about Jesus, your Son, that you gave and who gave his life, that we might have salvation, that we might have the hope of heaven and also help in this world. Oh, we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, for the good day we've had, for the souls that have been saved in the different ministries, the bus ministry and the jail ministry. And we thank you, Father, for that. We thank you for the good spirit we felt this morning in the singing and in the service. And we pray that you'd do it again tonight as we come together. Lord, Sunday nights are kind of our family night, if you will. All the ministries come in here together. Uh, almost everybody's in here. We've got, of course, some out working the nursery and things like that. But for the most part, we all come together here on Sunday night and just want to worship together and rejoice in your goodness and also learn something that might help us as we try and live for you and serve you in these last days. Thank you for the good week, for the answered prayers this week and the trip that me and Brother Steve had and also the couples retreat and how good that it went. And uh, thank you for the souls saved throughout this week. We just praise you for your goodness. We ask you to help our hearts to be right tonight as we talked a lot about the heart this morning thought about it, I pray that you'd remove all the pride that's in our heart, that it might not be hindered to the Spirit tonight, and I pray that you'd remove all the critical spirits and hateful spirits and all those things that we know grieve the Holy Ghost, that you might flow freely. Bless the choirs, they'll sing again in just a minute. Be with the congregational singing that is to come and the special singing, and everything that's said and done, we pray that you would fill it with your Spirit, bless your people, and that you also would be pleased with it. We'll praise you for it in Jesus' name, amen. Listen while the choir sings again.
while the choir comes down tonight. in your hymn book. Brother Matt, Brother Matt, come back. I need to ask you something. 493 in your hymn book. Let's rear back and sing it for Jesus. I mean, give it all you got. Let's push it out and enjoy the Lord tonight. Hey, why don't you relax a little bit? Let's don't worry about uh, what's going on afterward. Don't worry about what time it is. And let's just see if the Lord might speak to us tonight. All right? Well, in Beulah Land, 493, get your song book. Far away the noise of strife things we got going on this week on uh, Thursday we're going to have growth visitation uh, plan on being here at 6 30 of course next Sunday is friend day and uh, we have got cards up here uh, to be passing out this week and we will be passing them out Thursday so keep those things in mind and be inviting people to next week uh, special friend day and then uh, on Saturday, we're going to have the prison service uh, down at the Little Prison. You have to be there at 6 o'clock. Uh, plan on going and being a part of that service. And uh, we are going to be serving a meal. Miss Kelly is in charge of organizing all that, so be praying for her. And then uh, we, uh, if you're going to go to the service, just bring the food with you. And if you're going to 
prepare some food, bring it up to the school. Uh, the glass doors at the gymnasium will be open. You just take it in there and put it in the cafeteria, and then they will get that uh, up to the prison. So that will be the little prison at 6 o'clock on Saturday. And then, uh, of course, the week after that, we've got the public school revival. Uh, be praying for that. And then uh, in two weeks, we're going to be taking up our first um, missions trip offering, two weeks from tonight. Uh, so keep that in mind also. All right, let's go ahead and have our ushers come forward, and uh, we will take up our offering. All right, while they're coming, children, you go ahead and get ready as well. Let me mention a couple of things. Be praying for Brother Wayne Randolph tonight. He is presenting uh, the ministry there. The Washington, the planning of the church in Washington State presenting that tonight over past Asheville. It's a kind of a special night because there is a mission board uh, in that church and it, we're trying to get him on that mission board. He's already met with them and had a good meeting with them tonight. He's presenting for them. So as you're sitting here, if you think of it, and while I pray in just a minute, pray for Brother Wayne. That would go well tonight. We, we really I think it could be a help to us if he could become a part of their mission board. So you pray about it. And I also want, you, want to ask you to pray for my mom. She's having knee replacement surgery tomorrow. She wanted me to ask you to pray, so I would ask you to do that, that the Lord would uh, help her. And then uh, I'm trying to mention some of our sick here. If we continue to pray for those that are sick, pray for Miss Kelly's dad. Now last week, or the week before last, before I left town, he was in the hospital with some other issues besides just the cancer he's dealing with, but he's out of the hospital doing better on that. Still, of course, dealing with his cancer, but keep praying for him. And I want you to pray for J.R. and Trudy as J.R. had his first treatment this week, I believe it was, and uh, he's having treatments for cancer. Pray for him. And Miss Trudy is awaiting, unless I've not heard it all, she's awaiting some further tests about what's going on in her body. So pray for her that it would be nothing too serious and that the Lord would just uh, touch both of them and pray the Lord to help them. And then Brother Gary's, of course, taking treatments for cancer still. Pray for him and Miss Clara. And uh, Miss Jill is doing well. Her daughter told me tonight, but that she is going to go through some more of that uh, rehab, I guess, or physical therapy. That's what it is. In the next few weeks, she'll start that again, so keep praying for her. Good to have the Parkers here tonight. I know they were here last week. And uh, they were here last week when I was gone. And then when I got back today, they were not here. And I started to take it personal. But they showed up tonight, so we're still friends, praise the Lord. Good to have her back. She is taking, had her first round of treatments, and it all went well. And we were just rejoicing before the service at all of that. And then we prayed also for Brother Carol Deck that had uh, a skin cancer removed, and he said that the surrounding tissues and everything they've studied has all come back good. Is that right, Brother? So we want to praise the Lord for that. Thank the Lord there's nothing uh, extra found there. And then I mentioned Miss uh, Oaks that at first kind of got a negative report and then uh, the Lord touched it and got involved and she has not had to start treatments yet. She'll get another report about Tuesday. So it's week to week now, but we want to praise the Lord uh, for how he turned it around last week. She was headed to the doctor, sort of down and looking like she's going to have to start treatments. And then when she got there, they tested her again and it had improved. And we feel like it had improved because we had asked the Lord to help her. And so I want to praise the Lord for that and then also continue to pray for all these folks that are sick. And I'm sure there are others that we have missed, didn't mention Miss Kim, who I think did get to come home last night, but obviously is still real sick and battling her cancer as well. So pray for these as you can remember them. We did give you prayer bulletins, uh, pass them out at the door this morning. I guess they're all gone. There might be a few still out on the tables. If you didn't get one, you can get it on the way out. All right, let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for prayer, and thank you, Lord, that you make it possible that old sinners like us can come boldly to the throne of grace, and that we can find grace to help. Because, Lord, we need help. We need it every minute. Lord, we need thee every hour, as the old song says. And uh, we mentioned tonight several folks that are going through troubles and trials and physical illness. And, Lord, sometimes that causes all kind of other illnesses as well or struggles and issues, financial. And uh, just many things can come out of that. And we pray that you'd bless each one of them. We pray that you'd touch them tonight. Let them feel our prayers and let them feel your presence even tonight. If they can't be here, we pray that you'd be with them wherever they are. If they're watching live stream, I pray that you'd bless them to know uh, that we're praying for them. We ask you, Lord, that you would meet with us in the rest of this service in a special way. Multiply this offering for us as you would see fit. And Lord, bless those that are able to give and those that are not. We pray that you'd bless each one. And Lord, we do ask you to bless the preaching that is to come and the singing that your hand would be in it. And we love you and thank you for everything you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, children, go ahead.
change in your hand and nobody's taking it from you yet. Oh, right over here, praise the Lord. All kind of money over there. That's where the money sits, obviously. Praise God. Anybody else? I didn't look in the balcony. Anybody got it? We need to get it. Whoa. Did you hit the lights back, sit there? They just flicker down here. Okay. We love Marvin. Got some, bring it on, children. That'll be all right. Praise the Lord. All right, you can open your Bibles to Psalm 95 and then 1 Samuel 25, like, much like we did this morning. We'll start in Psalm 95. We're going to end up in 1 Samuel 25. We had several saved today in some different places. Brother Joel, did you tell me two in junior church this morning? So I had two more saved in junior church. That's several in the last couple of weeks, so we praise the Lord for that. And then Brother Allen texted me and said he had four saved in his jail service this afternoon. And uh, listen, don't... Uh, here, everybody look right here real quick. Look here just so I can tell you a little something real quick. Now, don't minimize when we say we had two saved in the bus ministry... Sometimes in your mind you're like, well, that's just, you know, that's them children. Well, yeah, exactly right. Children that are never go to hell now. Amen. And also be careful that you don't, oh, I don't know about it. You think all them kids are getting saved. Well, Jesus said, except you come as a little child, you cannot. So it's a pretty good, pretty good possibility that them children are getting saved. Amen. So be careful not to minimize that. And then also be careful not to minimize the prison salvation, the jail salvation. Sometimes a man or a woman has to get to a low point in life where they will turn to Jesus. And so I'm thankful that we have men that are going in there and presenting the gospel to these guys at some of the lowest moments of their lives. And so uh, when we tell this, everybody don't have to, you know, you don't have to do backflips. You don't have to shout and all that. But let's be careful that we don't brush them off like it's not a big deal because it was children or because they were in the jail service it's just as big a deal for eternity as if they got saved right here in this service amen and so i want to praise the lord for the salvations had several last week and uh, had had a fellow get saved i believe in the visitor reception room last sunday after the service and we want to thank god for all of that so don't miss what god is doing and uh, psalm 95 and then first samuel 25 
I thank you so much for all you do. When I thought I wasn't going to get my treatments, when the insurance wouldn't pay for them, I thought I'd just have to do without them. And I said, no, I'm going to call the church and ask them to pray because I knew you could get through to God even when I could. I knew there was people here that had a heart for God. And, and I just want to thank you so much for what you did. I do not know the things you are facing the battles ahead or the victories to win but i can tell you his love never faileth for jesus is always a compassionate friend and he's been there in my good times and bad times he's been there when i could not carry all my lord's been there when my heart had no words the loving father still heard and i've never been alone for he's been there he's been there in my good times and bad times he's been there when i could not carry all my lord's been there when my heart had no words the loving father still heard and i've never been alone for he's been there i was trying to count it up the other day i've been in i think it's 24 or 25 different uh, preaching sessions since i was here last week uh since I was here last and I preached in several of them and then was attending in several of them. And my heart's pretty full too, Miss Parker, to be honest with you. I'm thankful for the goodness of God. And uh, if you can't see His goodness in your life, you need, you need some work. You need some work done on your insides. Your, your perspective's all wrong. Let's uh, open our hymn books. We're going to preach. I'm going to preach in a minute. I told you let's just relax tonight. So let's sing on 157 together a little bit of blessed assurance. You can mark your Bible passages. We'll turn to them. And uh, what a blessing that this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Don't miss the words now, wonderful words written by Fanny Crosby, blinded at a young age by the mistake of a doctor, but never bitter. As a matter of fact, she thought it was the hand of the Lord that had done that in her life. Let's sing it out good and loud as best we can. I don't know where Miss she just there with us. I'll do the best I can, find a key, all right? Sing it with me, and we'll just sing it as unto the Lord. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Listen to these words. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. Sing it out now. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long this is my story this is my song think about it now praising my savior all the day long when you're, when you're saying those words this is my story you need to always be thinking by the grace of god by the grace of God, this is my story. This is my song. Let's sing that second verse. Perfect of me. Sing your parts now, church. Perfect delight. Visions of rapture. Visions of rapture. Now burst on my side. Angels. Angels. Oh, yes. 
from above echoes of mercy echoes of mercy whispers of love sing it out this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long this is my story good singing this is my song. bless his holy name praising my savior all the day long when the apostle paul was still saul and he was chasing down christians and killing them it said that he was given papers when he was on his way to Damascus that, he, that if he found any of this way, that's the way our Bible says it, of this way. You know, the world wants to look at us that are of this way and kind of make fun and kind of laugh and kind of snicker. And I want to say I'm so thankful to be of this way. I'm, I'm so thankful that I am a Christian by the grace of God and that, you know, this is my story and this is my song and I get to praise my Savior all the day long. Listen, we ought to be thankful for that. I bless His holy name on the last verse. Perfect submission. All is at rest. All is at rest. <laughs> Yeah, I in my Savior, Savior, am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, watching and waiting. Yeah, my. Looking above, filled with His goodness. Lost in. Watch me on this course now. This is my story. This is my song. Sing it out. Praising my Savior all the day long. Let's hold these words now. Watch me. This is my story. This is my song. That's right. Sing it, church. Pray. My All the day. All the Let's say that last line again. Praising. Praise. Praising my Savior. All the day. Amen. Amen. Good singing. Psalm 95. We'll look at 1 Samuel 25. We want to praise the Lord, as I said this morning, for several of the good things that he's done for us. You got me on this one, brother. And uh, one of the things is that just lately, the Lord has given the church, we've, we've seen some of them in person, some are here tonight, but bring these lights down just a little bit. We've been given three healthy babies in the church congregation. We got Tucker Green. I think he's here tonight, right back there. We've seen him. Praise the Lord for that. Cross Hogan. I don't know if they're here tonight or not, but Brother Butch Hogan's grandbaby. And then also just this week, uh, Allison and Nick's little boy, Sawyer Kelly. And he was in the hospital last night, but he's home now. Is that right, Miss Stiles? And all three are doing well. You know what that is? That's the, the grace of God and the blessings of the Lord. And we prayed about each one of them. We mentioned them. And so we want to be sure and praise the Lord for his goodness in helping these folks have healthy babies. I like babies in the church. You say, well, sometimes they scream out in the middle. That's exactly right. And it wakes up four or five of you adults every time it happens. And it's a wonderful blessing. And uh, you know what it is? It's life. When you've got children in a church, it's life. I preach in some places, listen, there's death. It's, it's all, it's just no life. There's no children there. There's no teens there. There's no young people there. And uh, often there's no life there. So we want to praise the Lord for that. I want to remind you of a couple of things. The friend day, the tracks here, very nice tracks for you to come by and get after the service and give them out, invite somebody. They don't have to be your close personal friend. It can be somebody you work with, somebody you pass, uh, you go to the gas station and buy gas at the counter. Give it to them say you know what would you come and be my friend at friend day give them that track and then Thursday night our first growth visitation of 2015 the last one of 2014 was a great one in November we had I don't know how many we had to take three or four buses we had a pile of people come out and go knocking on doors and we want a good group let's start the year right as a matter of fact for some of you that have never come it'd be a great way to start the year to come to the first growth visitation this coming Thursday night and let's get out some invitations for our friend day and that'll be a blessing. Now I mentioned it this morning, let me mention again, if we have bad weather on a Sunday, we will still have church, both Sunday morning and Sunday night. But we'll send out a church call to let you know if we're having a service at 10 or at 11 or both. We'll put a call out that morning 
And if you're not on the church call list, you need to come and see Brother Matt's here tonight. Miss Miranda thinks in the nursery and my wife. And so you can come by and see Brother Matt or you can call the church number this week and say, I need to be put on that church call list and we'll get you on that. All right? Psalm 95. I believe Brother Ken mentioned the business meeting Wednesday night. Did you mention that? All right. Wednesday night, well, we, we will be having our year end for 2014 business meeting after the service. We will have church. Don't lay out because you don't want to come to business meeting. You can leave after the service. We'll have a little bit shorter service. Then we'll have our business meeting. If you've never been here for one of ours, you're free to come. Even if you've not joined, you're free to sit there and see what's going on and see how that we do it. And uh, we'll see what the Lord's got for us in this coming year. All right, let's look in the Bible. Psalm 95, give me your attention for a little bit tonight. I want to get through this. I believe the Lord would have us to see it. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture. Psalm 95, verse 7. The sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, look what he says. Now, harden not your heart as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. So he's given an admonition here to uh, the, if you will, the Israelites, David's writing, and also to us as it is recorded in the word of God. And he is challenging us about our heart but look he says as they did as they tempted the Lord when they didn't have enough faith to go into the into the wilderness uh, into the uh, promised land and was forced to stay in the wilderness and when they tempted him and proved him and saw his work and so he says don't be like they were don't harden your heart let's pray together heavenly father I pray that you'd speak to us tonight from your word I thank you for the Bible I thank you for things that you show us even though we've read it many times you show us new things in it and I appreciate that I'm thankful for the unsearchable riches of the word of God I ask you to stir our hearts again tonight in Jesus name and all God's people say it now, if you were not here this morning, let me review just a little bit. With all the talk and the emphasis on the heart around the Valentine's holiday, I felt like God wanted us to know today that He cares about our heart. That he cares about your uh, heart, the spiritual condition of your heart. Now, as I said this morning, He commands us to guard it. Proverbs 4.23, keep thy heart with all diligence. That means continually throughout your whole life. For, out of it, that means because, out of it, all are the issues of life. And we saw this morning that our words come out of it. Our words come out of our heart, of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Have you ever heard somebody say something, say, well, I don't know where that came from. You ever heard anybody say that? Well, the answer is their heart. That's where it came from, because that's what God said. Now, it can be surprising what is in our heart. Have you ever been surprised at something you thought or something that you said? Sure you have. If you'll be honest, because your heart is so desperately wicked, you get surprised at the things that come up out of it. Our words come from our heart. Our ways come from our heart. As he thinketh in his heart, so is he, the Bible says. So how we are on the inside eventually comes out on the outside. Our worship comes from our heart. That's why he said, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Solomon turned his heart. His wives turned his heart away from the Lord near the end of his life and he began to allow the worship of false gods in the kingdom. So our worship is tied to the condition of our heart. And then finally our wickedness comes from our heart. Out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications and so on. And at the end of that verse it says all these things come from within. So God knew the importance of the power of our heart's condition. So he said guard it. Be careful what you put in it. Be careful what you listen to, what you look at, what you read, uh, who you hang around. Be careful about your heart because it is so important to our life. And so this morning I took that a step further and I looked at pride, the greatest heart disease. And pride is a killer. I said that over and over this morning and we all have it. And pride is something that God hates and something that God has to resist in our lives. So we must guard our heart that the pride that is a natural thing is not allowed to rule and reign in our hearts. It has to be put under, under the submission of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I am thankful that it can be that way. You can walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. If we walk in the flesh, pride will be a major part of it because our flesh is inherently proud. But if you can walk in the Spirit, the Spirit can give us victory over even our wicked heart and the pride that is in it. So tonight, I want to take a few minutes and look at another problem we sometimes have in our hearts. In our text, in verse 8, we are told, harden not your heart. 
Solomon wrote in Proverbs 28, verse 14, Happy is the man that feareth the Lord, but he that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief. Many of you know from being in church and reading the Bible and studying it and hearing it preached that Pharaoh's heart was hardened toward God and toward the children of Israel as he continually refused to let God's people go. It said that God hardened his heart and then later his heart was hardened, I believe, by himself at different times. Nonetheless, that hard heart caused Pharaoh to go through some troubles and trials and a eventually caused his death and the death of his entire army. And so God is telling us, harden not your heart. We see it in the life of Pharaoh. We see it in some other Bible characters. But tonight I want to show you a man that I am saying died of a hard heart. Turn to 1 Samuel 25. 1 Samuel chapter 25. 1 Samuel 25, we'll read a couple of verses. We're going to look at a lot of verses in this text here. I want you to stay with me for a few minutes tonight. In 1 Samuel 25, we'll start looking in verse 2. The Bible says, go ahead and get there. If you're not there yet, keep finding it. 1 Samuel 25, verse 2. And there was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel. And the man was very great, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding. Some of us ought to say amen because God gave us a wife of good understanding. And we married up and of a beautiful countenance. Amen right there. But the man was, some pronounce this churlish, I pronounce it curlish. But the man was curlish and evil in his doings. And he was of the house of Caleb. And so you have a marriage here. You have a man and a wife, and the wife was a good lady, and she was a, a, a lady that had wisdom and a, a, a lady that was of a beautiful countenance. And we see later that she was a, a good wife to him. And we have a man here that was, was on the other side of the spectrum. He was curlish. Now the word curlish literally means cruel, devious. And if you look uh, up the name, or look up that word in a Bible dictionary, or look up that word uh, in a dictionary, you'll find out it means hard-hearted. The Hebrew word used for curlish right here literally carries the meaning hard-hearted. Now, when I was thinking about this story, I already had hard-hearted on my mind, and I already had some verses in the Bible I knew that had that phrase in it. But then this story came to my mind because of the way it ends, though. The way this story ends is where I got my original thought and I had not studied it out yet and I did not know that the Hebrew word for curlish here had that in its definition, but God knew it. God knew that this man was a hard-hearted man and he laid him on my mind. So I want to look at his story. and You need to understand where we are here in the life of David and the life of this family. David has been living for some time on the run from King Saul. Now during this time while he was on the run, God had started to bring an army to him. Literally, while living in a cave one day, a bunch of men show up and they say, David, we want you to be our captain. We don't want to follow Saul, who is the king right now. We want to follow you. Even if that means living in a cave, if it means living on the run, we want to follow you. And so God began to bring men to David and they would submit themselves under his leadership. And in this text, we see that there was at least 600 at this point that were in the army of David. Now, some of these men become what we know as David's mighty men. And so it was a significant army not only in number but also in ability. If you've ever read about David's mighty men, they were some awesome soldiers. They were probably what we would say the first Navy SEALs. I mean, they were the real deal. And so David had under his uh, authority a great force, if you will. And David looks around and realizes that he and his men are in need of some supplies. That they do not have all the things that they need. And so David gets the idea when he hears that Nabal is near. And David says, I'm going to send to Nabal and ask if he'll give us some supplies. You say, well, why would David just assume that? Well, the reason he would assume that Nabal would help him is because David and his men had previously helped Nabal. Let me show it to you. In, uh, let me find it here in verse 7. Look at verse 7. The Bible said in verse 7, And now I have heard that thou hast shearers. Now thy shepherds which were with us, we hurt them not. So David's men and his army were in the same place as Nabal's shepherds. David said, We didn't hurt your men. Neither was there aught missing unto them all the while they were in Carmel. Now if you remember earlier, Nabal lives in one place, but all of his sheep and all of his abundance is in Carmel. And so his men were over here keeping the sheep, and David and his men ended up staying near there. And what David said was, not only did we not take any of your stuff, and we could have, 
But we actually protected your men and your stuff. We protected your sheep. We protected them from bandits. We protected them from thieves. As a matter of fact, if you'll go on down with me to verse 15 and 16, it says here, but the men, David's men, were very good unto us. This is one of Nabal's servants giving the report. And he said, and we were not hurt, neither missed we anything. Look at this. As long as we were conversant with them when we were in the fields. They were a wall unto us both by night and day. All the while we were with them keeping the sheep. So even when Nabal's own servants said, they took care of us. David and his men, they didn't have to, just out of the kindness of his heart. They didn't take advantage of us. They didn't steal any of our sheep. As a matter of fact, they guarded us from anybody else taking anything from us. So David assumes, because he's been good to that man, that that man might return the favor and give them some of the supplies that they need. But instead of doing that, if you look at verse 10 and 11, Nabal answers them roughly. The Bible said in verse 10, Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. In other words, he's taking a shot here at David. He says, I know that David's broken away from Saul, which by the way, David only did because Saul was trying to kill him. He had been a faithful servant to Saul. But Nabal now is kind of just uh, being a smart aleck, if you will. In verse 11, shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shears and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? By the way, he did know who they were. And he did know what they had done. He is just being hard-hearted right here. So he gives a harsh answer. Now they bring the answer back to David. When they bring this answer back to David, stay with me as I lay the groundwork here. Once David hears these words, he makes a decision. He decides now that he's going to get his supplies from Nabal a whole different way. So look at it in verse 13. In verse 13, the Bible said, And David said unto his men, Gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword, and David also girded on his sword. And there went up after David about 400 men, and 200 abode by the stuff. And so David gets word that Nabal said, we're not going to help you. As a matter of fact, Nabal insulted you, David, and acted as if you were a rebel when no, and not deserving of his help. And so in verse 13, David says, okay, everybody put your swords on. Now you need to understand, they wasn't putting their swords on just so they could go have a business meeting. All right, They wasn't putting their swords on so they could go down there and just have a little chat. David had decided we're going to get the supplies now a different way. As a matter of fact, if you look at verse 21 and 22, it shows us what David had on his mind. Now David had said, this is what he had said to his men, Surely in vain have I kept all that this fellow hath in the wilderness. In other words, he said, we protected him and we done it for nothing. We shouldn't have taken care of him. Now I don't know if that's a good spirit either. I'm just showing you where David's heart was so that nothing was missed of all that pertained unto him, and he hath requited me evil for good. David said, I was good to him, and he's been evil back to me. Look at verse uh, 22. So, and more also, do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave of all that pertain to him by the morning light, any that pisseth against the wall. See, what's he saying right there? David said, we're going to wipe them all out. David said, I was good to him. He had a chance to be good back to me. He's not giving me and my men what we need, so we're going to go take it. And not only are we going to take what we need, but we are going to wipe out Nabal and his entire family and his soldiers and everything that he's got. David is upset. Now, enter the picture, Nabal's wife, Abigail. A servant sees what happens. A servant is there when the men come to David and a servant hears what Nabal says to the boys that are going to go back and tell David and that servant has enough sense to know this. When David hears that, we're going to be in trouble. So that servant runs to Abigail, Nabal's wife. And he says just what you've heard. He says, David sent to us for help and Nabal has answered him harshly. And then he goes ahead and says, and by the way, David's men were good to us. David's men protected us when we were out there with the sheep and they took care of us at night and in the day. And he says, and now harm is going to come to us. When Abigail hears this, she gets involved and she goes and she intercepts David on his way. And in verse 32, if you look at it, she prevents a war. She's already spoken to David on behalf of her husband. And David said to Abigail, verse 32, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel which sent thee this day to me. And blessed be thy advice. Listen to me, men. You can get advice from a lady. Well, bless God, I'm the man of my house. Well, bless God, if you got any sense, 
God probably gave you a wife with some wisdom that could keep you from doing stupid things from time to time. Amen. This woman, listen, this woman not only spares her husband here, but she saves David from, I think, making a mistake. You'll read that on down. Look at this. Blessed be thy advice and blessed be thou which has kept me this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself on my own hand. For in very deed, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, which hath kept me back from hurting thee, except thou hasted, uh, hadst hasted and come to meet me, surely there had not been left unto Nabal by the morning light any that pisseth against the wall. David said, if you hadn't come, I'd have killed you and everybody else. But look what David said. He said, the Lord did this. The Lord used you. I'm going to tell you something. I thank the Lord for my wife. I believe she's in the nursery tonight. Hey, there have been times she has said just the right thing to keep me from doing something stupid. I don't know how many of y'all know David Gibbs. I know he's been here. By the way, he's coming to our camp meeting this year. David Gibbs is a lawyer, but he's a preacher, and he is a brilliant man. I'm talking about a brilliant man. I have been with him several times in the last few years, and one of the things he does kind of for fun or kind of to sharpen his skills, I don't really know why he does it because he's a very precious man, but sometimes when you're sitting around eating at a meal uh, or like at a camp meeting or whatever, he likes to get into a little back and forth with somebody. He likes to get somebody going that'll challenge him a little bit, and then he, he goes after them uh, just with words. They just get into a little, you know, he can just get somebody to say something, and he'll start questioning it. Pretty soon you start uh, going back and forth. Well, I had witnessed it many times and enjoyed it a great deal. As a matter of fact, I had participated every chance I got by throwing the other people under the bus so that I could watch Brother Gibbs uh, just to blow them away in front of all of us for our entertainment. Saw one young man one time, we was on the mission field, Brother Gibbs was getting on him. Before it was all said and done, he was giving away his own personal property. Brother Gibbs had convinced him he needed to give away, he had a pistol. Brother Gibbs said, do you have anything of value? He said, well, I've got a pistol. Before it was over, he had promised to give away that pistol because Brother Gibbs was working on it. And the next morning, we all got back together. I said, hey, Brother Gibbs, remember what he said last night? Just so they'd start all over again. Well, in Australia, I was very, two years ago, I was very nervous about preaching there. I always like to try to find some kind of humor to loosen myself up. And I'd heard people do this before. I had heard preachers say that there was another preacher coming after them that was the main speaker. And so they would use this illustration. They'd say, how many of you like to go to the Mexican restaurants? People raise their hand. They'd say, you know, at the Mexican restaurant, you get the free chips and sauce. And everybody says, oh, yeah, amen. He said, and then after that, you get your main meal. And they said, sure. Well, here's what you say. You say, well, I'm the free chips and salsa, and the main meal is coming later. Well, that night I was preaching, and Brother Gibbs was going to preach after that. So I was going to use that. I thought, this will be good. This will loosen everything up. It will loosen me up. We'll all laugh a little bit. But instead of saying the main meal, now, how many of you actually know who David Gibbs is and what he looks like? He's an extremely large man. I'm talking about large man. It is a blessing to go eat with him. You would not believe what it is like. That's a whole other story. So I get up and I start that. I'm scared to death. I'm in Australia. I don't know how they're going to, I don't even know if they're going to laugh at anything. I'm worried about connecting and all these other things. So I start saying that. I said, look, I'll get out of the way tonight because, you know, and I start talking about that. And I said, now tonight, that's me. I'm the chips and sauce. And here's what I said. I said, the big burrito's coming later. <laughs> Yeah, boy. They all laughed. All them Australians that are non-emotional, they busted out laughing just like you did. And it was on. Now, honestly, I didn't even register until, until they laughed like they did. I thought, boy, they laughed a little extra hard for that. And then it hit me. Oh, big. You, you said big, and he's really big. <laughs> so that night at the meal, it began. Uh, did you call me big tonight in front of everybody? I said, no, that, that is not what I meant. Well, it was on then. <laughs> he is a lawyer, you know. He said, now you're lying. Now you're a liar. He said, you think these? And it was on, on. And it went day, and then the second day, and then the third, every meal, there would be new people sitting at the table, and they were all loving it like I used to love it when it was somebody else. And people would say, just quit answering. I'd say, you can't quit answering. He's a lawyer. He knows what he's doing. You know, I think I'm pretty smart, but after that I was thinking, I am stupid. He is brilliant. I'm sitting in the office one day. I wasn't even talking to him. I was talking to my own wife. You ought to be able to talk to your own wife without a lawyer paying attention. I was talking to my own wife. She had just spoke to the ladies. The pastor's wife was sitting there, a young lady as well. I said, Miss Cassie, the pastor's wife. I said, how did Becca do when she spoke to the ladies? Well, she said, oh, she did a good job. She did a good job. Becca says to me, she said, Tony, I'm sitting right here. What do you think she's going to say? All right, so I said... A common sense thing. I said, all right, Miss Cassie, when she leaves the room, I'll ask you again. You can tell me what you really think. 
Brother Gibbs from across the room. Did you just call the pastor's wife a liar? I said, no. Yes, 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 I heard you just now call the pastor's wife. No, yes, you did. You said that what she told you wasn't the truth. That's a liar. You called her a liar. He said, oh, wait till this church finds out they love their pastor's wife. I thought, you got to be kidding. He was getting on me one night eating. He says, preacher, I was, and he never had, I kept thinking he was going to do it from the pulpit. He kept not doing it. And then we'd sit down and eat, and he'd say, Preacher, I keep trying to let this go. He said, but walking across the yard here, two or three men stopped me and say, We can't believe you're going to let him get away with that. He kept saying it. And finally he said it, and I said, My goodness. I said, These people sound like the crowd that was yelling, Crucify him, crucify him. He said, Did you just call these people God haters? I said, No. Oh, yes, you did. That's exactly what you just said. So one night after two or three days of this, we're sitting at the table, and he's wearing me out, and I'm getting a little ticked off. I know y'all can't believe that. My wife's sitting here beside me, and he says something, and, you know, Miss Stiles always tells me how good I am at hiding my emotions. Obviously, it, you know, Becca could tell. And I just thought, all right. If I was a hockey player, I threw my gloves off, you know. I'm thinking, I'm going to thrash this guy. That's what I was thinking. And I, I turned, and right before I could say anything, Becca said, we was eating pizza that night. Becca says, shove that pizza in your mouth. <laughs> and I went, <coughs> okay. Now, you know what she did? Saved my life. Because I am no match for his mind. That good wife saved my life. That's what Abigail did right here. She got involved. Listen, saved her own life, saved the lives of all of her servants and all of her children. We'd do good to listen to them from time to time, men. Now, when all was said and done, she had spared the life of her husband, this hard-hearted one. In verse 36 and 37, look how it ends up, though. And Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he held a feast in his house. He don't even know what's going on. Like the feast of a king, Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunken. Wherefore, she told him nothing, less or more, until the morning light. But it came to pass in the morning... When the wine was gone out of Nabal and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him and he became as a stone. The man that died of a hard heart. I want to show you a couple of things from this story that I believe are characteristics of a hard heart. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. We have got to guard our heart. We've got to keep the pride out. But listen, here's another problem we've got to watch for. Very quickly, number one, Nabal was ungrateful. Ungrateful is a sign of a hard heart. Nabal had no appreciation for what David and his men had done for his shepherds. He had no appreciation for how they had helped him become as wealthy as he was. He's throwing a big party this night over all the good harvests and all those things that he's got, not even understanding that others had helped make it possible in his life. He was ungrateful. He had neither recognized nor rewarded their kindness or their sacrifice. You say, well, what sacrifice did they do? In verse 16, the servant told Abigail this. He said, they were a wall unto us both by night and day. So that means while the shepherds could lay and sleep peacefully, David and his men are taking turns with the watch so that nothing happens in the middle of the night. So David's men were losing sleep so Nabal's men could rest. So there was sacrifice involved. He didn't appreciate the sacrifice. He didn't care about what had happened. And so Nabal is ungrateful. When given the chance, he didn't offer so much as a thank you. I want to say to you, one of the great sins of our day, particularly in America, is a spirit of ungratefulness and unthankfulness. I repent of it regularly. Regularly I say to the Lord, Lord, I know that I am just not as grateful as I ought to be for how good you have been to me in my life. And I believe you probably could say the same. In Romans chapter 1, we see a people that are plunged into deplorable sinfulness. And it all started in verse 21 where the Bible says, when they knew not God, or excuse me, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. And it goes on at the end of the verse and says, and their foolish heart was darkened. Isn't it interesting that Paul writes that their unthankfulness affected their heart? You know what it did? Their heart grew hard because of their ungratefulness. When you are ungrateful, it's a sign of an inwardly hard heart. Let's be careful to keep a tender heart of gratefulness. Listen, not only to God, young people. You ought to be a grateful young person in here tonight. 
If you're in this church, you have a blessed life and you ought to be grateful to God and to the others in your life that make it possible. God uses people to be a blessing to us all the time. We need to learn to be grateful not only to God, but to the people God uses to be a blessing to us. Miss Parker stood here a minute ago and it would have been perfectly fine if she would have just thanked God. It would have been perfectly fine if she would have just stood here and said, I want to thank God for taking care of me. And I want to thank God for working it out where they could pay for the treatment. And thank God that I've been feeling good since the treatment. That would have been perfectly fine. Does everybody agree with that? Say amen. But you know what? She went a step further and here's what she said. I also want to thank this church and all of you that prayed for me. That spirit of gratefulness, not only to God, who is the answer for it all, but also to the people that God uses to be a blessing in our lives. It is a sign of a hardened heart when you are ungrateful. Nabal was ungrateful. Secondly, Nabal was uncaring. In verse 10, if you look at verse 10 with me again, chapter 25, and Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. Now you realize they had just come and said, David has a need. And David's soldiers have a need. His men need food. They need water. They need supplies. Uh, they need some uh, clothes. They need some blankets. They're living a rough life. You know what? Nabal was uncaring. As a matter of fact, Nabal wasn't interested in anybody's needs but his own. If you look in verse 11, he said, Shall I then take, notice these words, my bread and my water and my flesh and he goes on to say and give it you know what that's a good sign of first of all an ungrateful heart and then an uncaring heart he said I don't, I don't care if David needs food I don't care about David's men I don't care about David's servants and, and they're saying but, you know, but David and them they were good to you and, and they were good to us he, he said I don't care why should I take what is mine and give it you know what that's a sign of a hardened heart a hardened heart that doesn't care about those that are in need. Hey, listen, let's not be a church of hardened hearts. Let's be a church. If we're going to be a church in action, we're going to have to be looking around. For